Good evening. Welcome to the Deschutes Land Trust 2021 Nature Night Speaker Series. I'm so glad that you could join us virtually. I'm Gianna Hempel, the Outreach Manager at Deschutes Land Trust. We want to begin this evening by respectfully acknowledging that we are visitors to the historical territories of the Warm Springs, Wasco, and Paiute bands of Native Americans. These bands are represented today by the Confederated Tribes of the Warm Springs Reservation of Oregon. The Deschutes Land Trust considers the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs an important partner in management and restoration of our protected lands. These tribal communities are the original stewards of the land, helping care for and connect with the land since time immemorial. We've added a link to the chat box for you. This link includes information to learn more about our local Native American communities and how you can contribute to the Confederated, Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs current efforts to restore their clean drinking water. If we could go to the next slide, please. For those who are new to the Deschutes Land Trust or would like a quick refresher, we are a nonprofit that works to conserve and protect lands throughout Central Oregon. Over the past 25 years, we have protected more than 17,000 acres of land, continue to care for these lands, and ensure they will be strong and healthy, both now and into the future. If you'd like to learn more about our work, visit our website, DeschutesLandTrust.org. We'd like to invite you to join us at our next virtual nature night on Wednesday, February 17th, from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Pacific. Dr. Tara Cornelissi will be presenting on the importance of insects. This should be a great opportunity to learn more about these often misunderstood but incredibly important parts of our natural world. You can find the registration link in the chat. The Deschutes Land Trust is passionate about conserving and protecting land, wildlife, and plant communities and connecting our community to the wonder of nature. If you'd like to make a difference and find yourself in a position to do so, I encourage you to support this work with a gift to the Land Trust. You can make a donation through the website link that was just posted in the chat box. Thank you in advance and thank you to all of our current supporters for everything you have made possible. All of the land you've protected, the miles of streams that you've, you've restored, the wildlife habitat you've conserved, the native plants you've helped make flourish, and all the ways you've helped com connect our community to the natural world. Thank you so much. A couple of notes for tonight's presentation. You have been muted and the chat feature has been disabled. However, tonight's speaker will be taking questions at the end of the evening. To ask your question at any point during the presentation, go to the bottom of your Zoom screen where you will find a Q&A box. Click on it, type your question there and send, and we will automatically receive it. If you're watching via Facebook Live, you can ask your questions in the chat. If you run into any technical difficulties during the presentation, our staff member, Rebecca, can help you troubleshoot. Please send an email to the email just listed in the chat. In the coming days, we will be sending you an email with a link and resources to tonight's presentation. So keep an eye out for that arriving in your inbox. And now for tonight's presentation. Dr. Suzanne Brander has been faculty at Oregon State University since 2017, after moving from the University of North Carolina Wilmington, where she was faculty for four years. Dr. Brander's research encompasses the fields of toxicology, endocrinology, and ecology. Dr. Brander's main focus is on the effects of stressors such as emerging pollutants, plastics, and changing climate on aquatic organisms. But her research and teaching also spans the links between ecological and human health. She has a PhD in toxicology and pharmacology from UC Davis and an MS in environmental science and policy from John Hopkins University. She has presented on plastic pollution to the legislature in Salem and on Capitol Hill in Washington, DC. Please welcome Dr. Suzanne Brander with a closer look at microplastics.
Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, and I'm so happy to be here tonight. Thank you for having me. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Can everyone see that? Wonderful. Well, again, thank you so much. I'm excited. I'm sorry, I'm Suzanne, we can't see yeah. it yet. Oh, okay, hold on, thank try you. again. How about now? Perfect. Wonderful. Well, again, thank you for so much for having me tonight. Um, and I'm going to be talking, um, like was mentioned, about microplastics. And we'll even be getting a little bit smaller than the micro size. And I'll just I'll um, explain what I mean by that. And I'll talk a bit about what we know and a lot about what we don't yet know, because even though uh, research on microplastics has been underway really heavily for the past decade, or so. And if you look back to studies in the 1970s, the first acknowledgement and um, observation of microplastics in the field uh, was published in 1972. We're still really getting a handle on what impact these really ubiquitous um, particles are having on our environment and potentially on our health as well. So I'll go through and of course have a bit of an introduction and talk generally about what the state of the field is and what we know and a little bit about effects on different organisms um, that depend on where they live, if they live in the water column or if they live in the sediment. Talk about how we're taking all of this data, all of these data that scientists are collecting and trying to figure out how to assess it, how big the problem is and what levels of microplastics are potentially a, a hazard to either ecological or human health. And then I'll talk a bit about a process I've been involved with in the state of California, which is the first state in the United States to pass broad legislative mandates to monitor microplastics in drinking water, as well as to come up with a risk assessment framework for marine ecosystems. So as most of you probably know, plastic use and disposal continues to increase. Um, on this slide, I have a picture of a Bakelite radio, which was patented in 1909. And this is an example of one of the very first types of plastic that was produced. Of course, it took some time to take off. And as we got into the 1960s, you started, started to see covers on um, Life magazine, for example, that were boasting the convenience of these disposable plastics. They're lightweight, you don't have to wash them, you can just throw them in the trash, they make our life so easy. And that's about the time when you see these lines starting to take off. And so as we're getting into the 80s and 90s, that slope starts to increase. And this graph predicts um, both plastic use and disposal through 2050, which sounds like it's a long way away, but we're only about 29 years from that date. And so just to summarize, as of 2015, 6,300 million tons of plastic waste had been generated. Um, only 9% of that was and, and still is recycled. Recycling remains relatively flat because it's not economically incentivized. 12% is burned and almost 80% of that is accumulated in landfills and the environment. And so if the current trends continue, we'll have about 1,200 metric tons of plastic waste in landfills or in the environment by, by 2050. So we need to do something. And a paper that just came out um, actually quantified that even though the US only has 4% of the world's population, we create about 17% of the world's plastic waste. So, and something I get asked often is either what is the link between plastics and climate change or climate change is a much bigger problem than plastics. Why are we, why are you focusing on plastics? We should be studying, you know, only climate change. And, and really the problems are linked and they're both linked back to our reliance on fossil fuels. Um, and there was a publication that came out in 2017 that I think gives a really good kind of visual of this. 
You can see that in 2014, plastic share of global oil consumption was approximately 6%. Uh, predictions are that by 2050, and it doesn't seem that, that many of these studies go beyond 2050, but they probably should start to, um, that if we can continue business as usual and don't limit our production or increase recycling or increase um, producer responsibility, it's going to go up to about 20% um, of global oil consumption. So, and again, there's an inherent link between these, these two problems. Um, I've seen it put as, um, as plastics being the solid form of climate change, which isn't exactly technically correct, but I think it's, it gets people's attention. So to summarize, we can see that plastic production is really outpacing our ability to, to do something about it. So it's building up in the environment. And once it's out in the water or on land, it's, it, it's difficult to remove microplastics. They're small, they're less than five millimeters in size, often far smaller than that. And it's difficult to, you can't take a Hoover to the ocean and just and get rid of all the microplastics. So we need to stop it before it gets out there. Um, many aquatic and marine organisms are affected, and that's really where the problem started to be studied. But now we know that it's in the air. We know that terrestrial organisms and us are also exposed to it. And so it's the, the problem has become a bit, the, the focus has become a bit broader. There are primary and secondary sources. A lot of what um, scientists like myself deal with are the secondary sources, the pieces that break off of large larger macro plastics. So say so your, your water bottle gradually breaks down in the sun and small fragments come off of it. And that would be a secondary source. And of course, they're accumulating um, in coastal zones and estuaries, as well as our, our soils. Um, something that has received more attention over the past couple of years are biosolids, which are amended from wastewater treatment, but then they're often used as fertilizer. and it's been discovered that that those biosolids also have microplastics in them that settle out during wastewater treatment. So it's it's pretty ubiquitous. What we're finding is that the shape and size can affect how it how it how animals interact with it, whether it causes an effect. Smaller plastics can sometimes be more dangerous, and we'll talk about why. But even though it seems like there's a study, there's something in the news about microplastics. It seems probably, you know, every day if, if you, you know, if you're on Twitter or on Facebook, you see something pop up on your feed. But if you look globally, and even if you just look at North America, and this is a review that myself and colleagues put out last year, it's really that the situation is still pretty data poor and that we just don't have enough information to really definitively know how much microplastics are, are too much or how much of you know, a particular type of plastic is too much. And, and this just gives you an idea of, of how the studies are, are really concentrated in some areas. So there's a lot of data um, in, you know, around British Columbia and South, and then in the Pacific Northwest, there's a lot of data on bivalves. But then you go down to California and Mexico, and they're really are no studies that have been done. And these are, this is focusing just on commercial fisheries. So the species that people are most concerned about because we're, we're eating them. Um, and so just, just conveys the fact that we still have, um, have a lot more work to do. Um, just to give an example of things that we see in seafood species, um, this is a study that was done in North Carolina on black sea bass. And these were sea bass that were sampled from off the coast of, of southern North Carolina. And at the preliminary analysis of their gut contents um, identified over 60 particles. And it's a lot, it's it's a lot of tedious work. You're pulling these very small items out of, of tissue that's been digested and filtered. And then you're trying to figure out what they are. And so we use microscopy and we use um, specialized instrumentation to be able to look at this little green particle and tell that it is polyethylene or to look at this yellow strand and know that it's cellophane. So we have chemical methods that we use to, to ID these different, these different items. And so I have students looking in fish um, gut contents. I have another student looking in otter scat to get an idea of how much otters are ingesting. Um, there's 
another looking in zooplankton, so sampling tiny little crustaceans um, and other organisms from off the Oregon and California coasts and looking to see which species are ingesting the most, how much, where is it concentrated. So just lots of lots of studies like that underway all, all over the world in different laboratories. So research on plastics is, is definitely, the, the, the papers are definitely growing exponentially as you, as you can see here in this um, paper. This is an editorial that came out last year. And so you can see from 1980 to 2010, so 30 years, um, publications were relatively flat. But then you get to 2010 and you can see that they just, there's, there's an explosion, particularly on microplastics. And we know, we know quite a bit about what's in the water. We know a good amount about what animals ingest, what they encounter and internalize. But thinking about effects, how, it, how does it affect their ability to grow or to reproduce or to swim? You know, sometimes we even look at things like gene expression, look at what's happening in their cells. That, the, the amount of research on that is much lower. And nanoplastics, which by most definitions are plastic particles that are smaller than one micron. So this is something you can barely see, you know, with, with a microscope, you need a specialized microscope to see the most nanoplastics, a, a scanning electron microscope. Um, but they're out there and they're potentially dangerous because they can cross, um, they can cross cell membranes sometimes, they can be translocated from the gut. And so you're starting to see more research on nanoplastics as well. I'll talk a bit more about that um, later in the talk. So I'm gonna focus some of my talk now on responses and what we know about how plastics affect fish crustaceans and, and other types of animals. And mainly we'll focus on marine and freshwater organisms here because that's the focus of my work. So we know microplastics are just ubiquitous in the ocean. And really this is even at relatively remote sites. So a lot of times people think you're going to find more microplastics, you know, a few miles from a, a, a large urban area and often you will. But ocean currents drive that distribution too. And so sometimes you might see distant sites that are not in close proximity to an urban area also um, having a lot of microplastics or macroplastics. Um, what the gyres, the oceanic gyres are good examples of that. Um, the seafloor sequesters a lot of microplastics as they age, their density changes and they sink and so the global estimate for microplastics on the seafloor is about 14 million tons. And so that's, that's really hard to even kind of wrap your head around, but, but quite a bit. And that's, that's more than twice as what is estimated to be on the ocean's surface. And so another thing, another paper that came out in 2020, so 2020 was a big year for microplastics um, publications, um, is that the ocean is not just a sink for microplastics. But scientists are also discovering that it's a source. And so there's aerial sort of launching of plastics with waves. And there are, when the ocean um, kind of crashes in on itself, there are bubbles that are produced that bring microplastics, as well as air, salt, bacteria, other kind of similar, similarly sized particles to the ocean's surface. And those particles can be launched into winds that are blowing above the water. And so just because it ends up in the ocean doesn't mean it stays in the ocean. And the smaller particles are entering global circulation. Um, kind of similar, if you've ever read about um, Saharan dust and how that circulates around the world, it's, it's a similar phenomenon. And that's why we're ending up with plastics in, you know, we find them at the poles because they can precipitate out of the air um, as well as getting delivered by ocean currents. Um, and microplastic presence in sediments is also being found to affect microbial communities. And so, again, it's a, a, a lot of us, and, and before I got into the microplastics field, even I thought, you know, microplastics, that's an issue for seafood. But it's, it's really, um, we're finding that it's, mul it's multifaceted in the way it affects um, most, most living things. So we know that microplastics are transferred through food webs. Um, and again, I talked earlier about the primary and secondary microplastics. And so this is anything 
under five millimeters. Um, often we're dealing with things that are much, much smaller. Um, most of the things my students pull out of fish or scat are on the order of you know, 500 microns or smaller. Um, sometimes they get larger items. So they're consumed by zooplankton. And often this is happening directly from the water, but even more often than that, what's happening is something called trophic transfer. And that's when a fish eats, you know, a smaller fish or a crab or a crab eats, you know, a prey item. And that causes those plastics that were ingested by their prey item to then be internalized by the predator. And so hence you get this movement of plastics um, through food webs and then eventually um, we might find them on our dinner plate. But something I feel like is really important to emphasize, you know, is not to get so down on seafood because even though seafood is clearly a, a vector for microplastics to humans, you can see in this um, graph here, and this is showing, um, this is based on the diet of a female adult in the USA. This paper um, looked at males, females, um, adult stage, and then also looked at male and female children. And across the board, what they found was that for all those groups, air is the highest source of microplastics, which you know is something that always makes people cringe a little bit when I say it. But you can think about it, these smaller particles are like dust. They're floating around, they're in global circulation, they're in our homes, they're outside. Um, and so we're, we're getting most of our exposure through air and then of course water and seafood um, come in um, second and third. And this has been studied less in mammals than it has been in marine species and freshwater species just because we discovered the problem in the ocean first or you know, were made aware of it. But some newer studies are looking at how this affects mice and it turns out they, they can get it in their water, they can get it in their food, they might inhale it, and then sometimes those particles can translocate to different tissues. So this is showing um, microplastics um, in the mouse's liver, this is showing microplastics in the kidney. Um, there was a recent study that came out showing microplastics in a, a human placenta. So it's, we are, you know, we are part of the plastosphere, right? We are part of, we are part of this, this issue, which, which makes it really important to fully understand um, the implications. So we know a lot more about toxicity to aquatic life than we know about anything else in terms of microplastics at this point. We know that size and shape are really important. In the earlier days of microplastics research, and when I say that, I mean 2010, 2011, so not that long ago, when I, when I was in grad school, we were really focused on the chemicals, that plastics were a potential vector for toxic chemicals, that things were sticking to them once they got into the water, if there were pesticides or other persistent pollutants out there, plastic sort of acted like a sponge and they absorbed to the plastics and then could deliver them to organisms. And the more we look into this, we're finding that it's not necessarily the chemical or it's not just the chemical, but that the shape of the plastic and the size can be really important. Fibers, for example, you know, which is one of the most prevalent types of microplastic found in, in marine and, and freshwater ecosystems, those tend to exert more negative effects than fragments or spheres. Um, and a lot of the early microplastics work was done with, you know, pre, you know, pre-purchased spheres rather than using more realistic um, microplastics that you'd find in the environment. And they can cause oxidative stress, um, which means it can cause production of reactive oxygen species, which can, then can cause damage to cells or tissues. And associated pollutants, including things that are added to plastics to make them change in shape or color. Um, you know, you can, you can take PVC and add um, bisphenol A or phthalate to it and make it flexible so you can shape it into lots of different things, for example. And, and those chemicals are toxic, but they don't always influence the toxicity of plastic. Um, 
in part because it takes a lot to get them to leach off and it takes a high amount of that chemical. But we're still figuring out about um, the smaller particles like nanomaterials because even though they're smaller, they have a large surface area and so it may be that there's still concern there. So there's a lot we don't know about um, the pollutants that are um, used to produce or that are associated with plastics. And there are sometimes unexpected consequences. So plastic um, is also an issue for sessile organisms. I think typically we think about the, the th things that move around first. Um, they can combine with other stressors to cause disease, to cause mortality. Um, in corals, for example, the plastic can cause light deprivation, and that can cause them to be more susceptible to, to disease example and so lots of lots of areas with corals can be heavily polluted and it's also not just the things we can see with our eye often these effects are happening at the microscopic level um, this is a protozoan it's a tintinid ciliate and they are found in estuaries they're found in the ocean they're found um, in some freshwater um, waterways too and so this this organism is about 100 to 120 microns in size. And this is a video of it ingesting microbeads that are 10 to 20 microns in size. And so this small protozoan ingests the particles, it's single celled, and then this is prey that is fed upon by larval fish. And so some work we did showed that the larval fish get more plastics if they're fed these prey with the plastics than they do just getting them directly from the water. So, so a lot of what we're doing is looking at this at a very fine scale and trying to answer one or two questions at a time to really get at what eventually what the big picture is. And you know, it's a, it's a big problem to solve and we need a lot of people working on it simultaneously because there are so many different plastic types, different additives, um, different types of products and so a, plast a plastic fragment from a beverage bottle might look different than a plastic fragment from a beach chair, even if they're made out of the same type of plastic. Um, they break down differently depending on what additives are there. Sometimes they're different shapes and colors. And then you have all the other stuff that's out there in the water from other activities that might also be absorbed to it. So it's. I, I show this slide to explain why it's taking us so long to, to figure all this out. It's a big, it's, it's, a, it's a big question. So something we're doing at Oregon State University, and this is through um, a group that I'm a co-leader of called the Pacific Northwest Consortium on Plastic Pollution. We're making some of our own plastics um, in my colleague Stacy Harper's lab and trying to make them as realistic as possible and then using those in, in experiments. And I'll give an example of that a little bit later. So lots of different effects, and I won't go too deep into this so I don't run out of time, but we see things like changes in behavior or changes in how much an animal eats or whether it's hungry enough to go after, um, after a prey item. So things like swimming speed and the direction the fish or invertebrate swims in can be affected. Um, there's also a study in rotifers, which are zooplankton that are a common, common prey item of, of fish and other slightly larger organisms. And what was found is that the size of the microplastic the rotifer was exposed to had an effect on whether it produced um, eggs at an earlier time or not. And so the smaller plastics had more of an effect, made the time to their first batch of eggs longer than the larger microplastics did. So lots of little, little steps in this research because you need to consider all of these different characteristics. Um, benthic organisms that tend to live either just above the sediment or in the sediment. Um, crustaceans, for example, such as lobsters, their weight decreases when they're exposed to plastic, potentially because if they have plastic in their gut, they think they're full, and so they're not going to go in search of food. And so that's the sense of false sati satiation. Um, a study in mole crabs showed that exposure to fibers 
reduced the number of days an adult crab lived, um, and it also reduced the number of days the crab held viable eggs. And so a lot of these effects, they aren't, I mean, one example is, is a reduction in lifespan, but a lot of times the effects are pretty subtle. It's a change in behavior or a slight reduction in eggs produced or a slight reduction in growth. But all of those little stressors add up, and that's been shown with chemicals that we've been studying for a long time, like PCBs and um, DDT and things that you know you've you've heard about being around for for years. And so, not too surprising. And the cumulative effect of all this is not is not fully understood. So to get to what we're doing at OSU, um, we've been studying tire wear particles. Um, and some of you might be thinking, I didn't realize tire wear particles were microplastics. Um, well, California has come up with a definition of microplastics, which now includes tire wear particles, in part because that is one of the most prevalent pollutants that's been found in a re recent study that was done on microplastic pollution in the San Francisco Bay. So tire wear particles coming from our cars, um, in the case of California, synthetic rubber is used to amend asphalt as well. Um, they're now known to be a sizable fraction of microplastic pollution, especially in urban estuaries. So San Francisco um, and Charleston, South Carolina has also had a few studies done. They're found in fish. And so we've been producing our own tire particles and then exposing small larval fish, as you're seeing, you see these little dots swimming around in the wells. Those are larval fish that are just a couple of days old um, in, in my lab in Corvallis. And what we're doing is measuring how they respond to different concentrations of tire wear particles to try to get at some of the subtle ways these particles that might be suspended in the water um, are affecting the way they interact with their environment. And so we do this in a specialized chamber um, where we're able to measure behavior in little glass wells. And then we can do this in a really standardized way that can be repeated over and over again to get reliable, reliable data. And I'm not going to belabor the results too much here, but generally what we're seeing, um, and again, this is work that's funded by the National Science Foundation and it's part of um, a multi-lab project called the Pacific Northwest Consortium on Plastic Pollution. We're finding that tire wear particle, particles at the micro and nano size, so we're producing particles that are smaller than one micron as well, that it modifies behavior and that this may depend on salinity because plastics can behave differently, their density can change or they can stick together more at higher salinities. Um, that it impacts behavioral responses in kind of a subtle way, um, and that size may also influence whether their behavior is affected. And these results are preliminary, and we're doing this with many different plastic types over the next year. And so we're just kind of at the beginning stages of this research. But we look at things like the distance they swim, the velocity, how they're turning, whether it's a sharp turn or, or not. Um, how long they're spending in different parts of their of their beaker, um, because that can affect that that can translate to changes in how they behave in the wild, and so you can see this is the control, this is a low concentration, this is a high concentration, and you can see that the the amount of those particles in the well can change where they're occupying that that environment in the environment and how they're swimming, you know whether they're whether they're freezing or not, whether they are meandering, sort of, you know, wandering and not really, you know, having having a clear directionality to their swimming. And all of these things can affect, um, potentially affect survival in the field. I'm not going to spend too much time on this one, but this just hits at the point I made a minute or so ago that it's really important to look at how different environmental factors are affecting the plastic. So we focus on salinity because my lab focuses on effects of pollutants, mostly on coastal and estuarine um, organisms. And so what we're finding between my lab and another lab at OSU 
is that nanoplastic um, agglomeration or whether the plastics kind of stick to one another, that changes as you increase the salinity. And so the nanoplastics are becoming larger effectively as you increase the salinity. And so it's just another example of things that need to be considered if you really want to get at what the micro, what the big issue, what the issue with microplastics is, and what we need to truly be concerned about when it comes to how much you know is too much to determining what thresholds might be appropriate for protecting organisms. And that's what I'm going to talk a bit about next. And it's a process that I've been involved with um, in the state of California uh, over the past year or so, and they've really been trying to get at how to assess risk. And in some ways, you know, we're at the early stages of this because we're still collecting data. There are still just hundreds of studies coming out, it seems like on a monthly basis. And so trying to still integrate all of that and really get a clear picture of what's going on. But this just gives you kind of a broad idea of all of the different factors that scientists and legislatures and um, regulators have to think about when they're thinking about how to regulate something like microplastics. And we haven't even gotten to nanoplastics yet. So all the ways an animal can be exposed, what is the size and shape, you know, what are the effects, what species do you want to consider to be most important, you know, and you get down here and that's where you start thinking about, you know, actually making a decision. And so that's kind of where, where we are right now. And that's just in the state of California. And there have been lots of different approaches that have been suggested. Um, one is that we try to take what we know about what's in the water and what's in the sediment and kind of predict out to what it will be at a later stage to get at what the risk will be going forward. You know, I showed you the slide in the beginning where the amount of plastic being produced was increasing exponentially out to 2050. Well, this paper looked out to 2100, so being a little bit more forward thinking there. And they tried to predict how much was going to be in the water and in the sediments. And then they did something called a species sensitivity distribution. And that's where you take lots of different, here in this case, it was lots of different marine organisms from fish to um, invertebrates like crabs. I think they even have, um, they have an al algal species on there. And you figure out what percentage of each of those species was affected, and then you fit a curve to it. And often what's done with other pollutants is that you want to protect the bottom 5%, the most sensitive 5% of those species. And so that's the direction um, that the field is moving in as we're trying to figure out how much is uh, how much is hazardous? How do we assess what is what is risky? There are other um, slightly more complex approaches. Uh, this a colleague of mine from um, the same Pacific Northwest Consortium on Plastics is using something called a Bayesian approach, and this is interesting because you're able to look at lots of different factors. So you're not just looking at the effect on a few species. You're looking at where the plastic's coming from, why it's stressful, you're considering the particular location, you're considering a whole list of different species. And so it gets complicated. And this is just one example. But what my colleague is trying to do is he's trying to get to an endpoint of thinking about how microplastics affect Pacific herring, Chinook salmon, an Olympia oyster. And the reason all of those species are picked is because they're ecologically important, but you know, they're also tasty. And so there's there's two reasons to protect them. And by protecting those species, we protect many others. And so that is work that's going forward um, in the San Francisco Bay estuary, where we're lucky to have a lot of data already because a lot of studies have been done there. But of course, you know, like the map I showed earlier, there's a lot of studies in San Francisco, but not a lot of studies elsewhere in California. And so that, that's what makes this a, a slow process. So, you know, right now it's about putting it all together and figuring out how an effect on one species might have a domino effect on others, 
how it might affect our you know, ability to catch seafood, how it might affect our health. So lots, lots of different factors to consider. Um, but California has really come out in front um, with their proposed risk assessment framework. And so this um, work was, um, was stimulated by Senate Bill 1263, which is the statewide microplastic strategy in California. And I think there are other states considering moving in this direction, but California might put a little pressure on since they're planning on starting to regulate um, things like drinking water um, for microplastics in a couple of years. But the, the recommendation is really to apply a precautionary approach. We might not know everything there is to know about microplastics, but we should probably start you know, protecting ourselves and the environment from it to some extent because it's probably not a great thing to continue to pollute the environment with microplastics. And so we're, we're trying to take a precautionary approach, um, or California is. And it, the state is being empowered to move towards things like source reduction and mitigation, even under existing uncertainties. And really doing a quantitative risk assessment is difficult right now, but we can start to put the pieces in place to get there. And so that's the point we're at now and, and really needs, not just in California, but globally, are to better understand sources, to understand mixtures. I mean, none of us are exposed to one microplastic type at a time. Um, think about what the priority species are. You know, know more about human health and ecological effects and how those are connected. Um, and, and really the types of approaches being used in California could be implemented in other states too. And that's happened with other types of environmental legislation over the years as well. So of course, there are lots of opinions and lots of research and regulatory processes underway around the world. Um, the World Health Organization came out a couple of years ago and uh, came out with a statement that microplastics in water um, are, there's no proof that they're harmful. And this was in part motivated by the fact that a lot of people around the world don't have access to clean water. If, you're, if you drink water from your river and it's going to make you sick, you, know, you don't want to drive people to avoid drinking bottled water, for example, um, because there might be some microplastics in it. So there's a difference of opinion between groups like the World Health Organization and groups like the European Chemicals Agency, which fall in, falls in line a little bit more with what California is doing, where they aren't able to determine a no effect concentration, but they still want to move forward with some regulation, you know, applying a precautionary framework rather than waiting until the problem gets severe enough um, to justify doing something. So in that, that's kind of where we are in this kind of push and pull moment of trying to get enough data in order to make decisions, but figuring out how much data is needed to make the right decisions, right? And of course, California comes in and has decided to adopt a definition of microplastics in drinking water and to move forward with, with that regulation. And that's what they're, they're moving forward with currently. And California really has come out with the world's first regulatory definition for microplastics. And it's a bit broader than some of the other definitions have been because they consider us a polymeric material, a polymer, right, to be something that has three dimensions that are greater than one nanometer or less than 5,000 micrometers. And the pieces don't have to be completely plastic. They can be a small percentage of plastic to be considered um, microplastic. And so they're trying to um, make the definition as broad as possible to be as protective as possible. So I'm going to finish up there, but I will say that this, this work is moving forward, not only in drinking water, but also in terms of assessing risk to marine ecosystems um, in the state of California. And that's something I'll be involved with in the coming year. Um, I do, as I finish up, want to acknowledge um, all of the collaborators that I've been lucky to work with over the past, I guess it's been almost seven years that I've been working on 
microplastics in addition to some other, other work on pesticides and other chemicals. Um, but these are individuals at the University of North Carolina Wilmington, as well as Oregon State University um, and Western Washington University now we, we collaborate with as well. Um, and I'll leave you with this slide which, um, where you can find more information at the website for the Pacific Northwest uh, Consortium on Plastics. And that's listed up here. And we're also on Twitter, Facebook, um, and Instagram. Um, and if anyone's interested in learning more, check out the website and you can even join um, the consortium through our website. And again, this is a collaborative project between Oregon State University and Western Washington University. Um, so I'm going to finish up there and I am more than happy to take your questions. Uh, thank you again for listening and for having me. It's been such a pleasure um, to have this opportunity um, and I'll, I'll let the questions come in if you have some. Hi Suzanne, thank you so much. That was so wonderful. Um, and a lot of food for thought. We do have some questions already coming in. Um, so I will start with Christina um, asks, well, first says, and then asks, um, thank you so much for your important work. This is a fantastic presentation. Can I just ask you how you stay positive or keep hope when looking at <laughs> these data? And then what is the single biggest thing we can do individually on a daily basis that can help? Sure, sure. I get that question quite a bit. I think all toxicologists do, or, or any scientist who works on something that's a bit, um, a bit depressing at times. My answer is that I would be more frustrated if I didn't feel like I was doing something about it. And I think that is what keeps me going, I think, because I feel like even though progress is slow, that we're making small steps um, in the right direction. Um, as far as something you could do, I would say, you know, something that I do, but not everyone has the time necessarily to do, is I've started doing things like we, we bake our own bread. And, you know, I even tried to make um, vegan cheese the other day. It wasn't very good, but, you know, I try to do things to reduce the ridiculous amount of plastic that comes with everything you buy. But, you know, vote you know, vote with your dollars, buy clothing secondhand instead of buying it brand new, things made out of natural materials like cotton um, or, or wool instead of polyester, which is the thing that keeps showing up as fibers um, in animals that are caught. Um, and also, you support companies that are making sustainable products. You know, and that I think we're gradually going to see more companies taking responsibility for the waste that they're producing. That's really the next step. And that's that type of legislation has even been suggested um, at the federal level. It hasn't gone anywhere yet, but hopefully it will. Great, great, thank you. Um, and this is almost a little bit of a follow-up, I think. Kathleen asks, are plastic producers involved in any mitigation efforts that you know about? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So that's a really good question. So I'm part of a group called the Society for Environmental Toxicology and Chemistry. I'm on the, the board for the North America, um, the North American part of the organization. And it's a really great group because it's a mix of people from academia from government agencies and also from industry. And so we have a, a microplastics interest group and there is a representative from Dow Chemical, for example. So there's there's people from, you know, I'm in another process where um, there's a consultant who mostly does work for industry, but he's involved in thinking about how California is going to set its um, regulatory standards. And so there, there definitely are people representing all of these different sectors. You know, we don't always agree with one another, but it's good that we're all in the same room and we're, we're, coming, we're coming at this from lots of different perspectives. Great. Um, Zachary, he asks, um, does leaving water bottles in the car cause microplastics to break down inside the bottle? <laughs> That's a really good question. You know, I don't 
know for certain. I do know that a study came out either last year or the year before that showed that microplastics were much higher in bottled water than they were in tap water. Uh, I don't think it's known exactly why that is. Um, it could be that there's some breakdown from the walls of the bottle and heat is going to increase that, although it would have to be really hot in your car. I don't know how hot it gets in Oregon, um, but after living in North Carolina, it doesn't feel that hot usually. But um, the other issue might be that in the plant, when the caps are screwed on, that there's fragments coming from the caps falling into the bottle. And so there's a couple of different ways plastics could be getting in there. So, you know, have your, um, your Nalgene bottle and fill it with tap water and you won't have to worry about it. Excellent. Um, Derek, first of all, I'll say hi, Derek. Um, <laughs> someone I know asks, um, I believe I heard recently about research that implicated tire wear particles with adverse effects on some salmon runs. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, yeah. So that was a couple of months ago. It came out of Washington State. Um, and I think there was one other university that was collaborating up there. Really fantastic detective work done by this group. And I think it took them on the order of five to eight years to um, figure out what was causing the toxicity. But there is a compound in the leachate from the tires. So not in the particle itself, although it would be in the particle, but they were looking at what was leaching off of these tire wear particles. And it's a, pro it's a compound called 6-PPD quinone, and it's basically produced by oxidation. And it turned out, you know, they looked at oh, hundreds, probably more than that, different chemicals as the one causing this in stormwater. But yeah, it turns out it's highly toxic to salmonids and probably toxic to other things as well. But of course, we're most worried about the salmon, understandably. Yeah. So that's something that something that we're looking into. And people have suggested trying to use um, green chemistry approaches to design tires that don't release these toxic compounds. Excellent. We have a lot of questions coming in. There are at least a couple that um, are asking about um, the products that you can put in your washing machine that catches microplastics and if those are helpful um, or recommended to use. Yeah, we. there are two different products. Um, I have one. Um, about three Christmases, Christmases ago, it was one of my Christmas presents. So you can tell them. <laughs> um, it's called a lint, a lint lover. Um, I could even put it in the chat or send it to Jana, but it basically you install it so it catches all the gray water from your washing machine and you empty it every couple of months. And it really does a pretty great job of catching fibers. Um, in my case, it also catches cat hair. Won't go into that, but it, it, it grabs everything and you know you toss it in the bin instead of it washing out to, um, to the Willamette or wherever you are. And then there's another similar product called Filtrol, which does the same thing. They're about you know, 100 to $200 and it's not, not too bad maintenance wise, even with, um, we're a family of four. So we, we do a lot of laundry and it still hasn't broken yet. Yeah. Nice. Um, something quite applicable to Central Oregon, especially, Robin asks, does burning plastic, um, as in wildfires, release microparticles that fall to the ground and water from the air? So that hasn't been studied much yet. Presumably, yes, um, if there's a lot of burning in a residential area. There are going to be a lot of different chemicals produced from household products as well as plastics. And that's something that a colleague of mine at Portland State University and I want to look into um, in some uh, fish that were exposed to the fires last September. And so that's a small side project that's spinning up. But yeah, I, we don't know yet, but I imagine there, that there is quite a bit of microplastic produced. It's a great question. Um, Ani asks, uh, bouncing off of the World Health Organization statement that bottled water doesn't have negative human health effects, is there any research showing that it matters if there is microplastic bits in my liver or kidneys? That's about where we are right now and that we know 
it's probably in our liver and kidneys. And we know, it, it, you know there was a study that came out uh, a few months ago that looked at, uh, they looked at people who had had colonectomies. Um, I'm glad I didn't do this research, but they basically took the colon and looked at the lining of the colon and found fibers and filaments. So we know it's getting into our tissues. We just don't know exactly what it does yet or how harmful it is. There are, for, from some collaborative work um, I've been doing with some other faculty at OSU, it looks like there might be effects on the microbiome, at least in mice, but we don't know about humans yet. So a lot, there's a lot of work to do. I realize that's not a, probably not a satisfying answer, but. Excellent. Um, do you know, it, you mentioned some legislation um, that's not moving in federally and some in California. Is there any in Oregon that you know of that's been proposed? Yeah, well, just to clarify, the, the legislation in California is definitely moving forward. Um, the They were basically giving, given a legislative mandate at the end of, end of 2018 to regulate drinking water by, I think it was 2022 and then also to develop this risk assessment process. So that's that's all in the works. Um, at the federal level, I know that, I think there's going to be a presentation next week or the week after. So there's continual efforts by scientists and environmental lawyers who go up there and give presentations to you know, the Committee on Environment and Public Works. Um, I know that, um, I think it was a senator from Oregon, I might be mistaken, but um, someone from the West Coast who introduced a bill recently about plastic pollution. And so it's just a matter of, of getting enough support, which you know, we, we may have a better chance of that um, going forward. Yeah. All right, just a couple more questions probably. Um, Kathleen is wondering, um, she says, I worked somewhere where they had plastic cups that were made from corn. Do these break down to better compounds for the environment? Yeah, I forgot to talk about bi bioplastics or there was a picture I saw on Twitter the other day of, um, it was a like a takeout container and it, it said eco pack on the bottom, but it was washed up on the beach and clearly it was not very eco. Um, the challenge is that a lot of those plastics will break down if they are industrially composted. So, and that's where you have to have a specialized facility that gets to a certain temperature and has certain conditions to actually make them break down. But if they just get into a landfill or get into the environment, they don't necessarily break down a lot faster than conventional polymers do. Um, I remember seeing a study at, uh, gosh, it was the Ocean Sciences Conference I guess last year, right before right before the pandemic, but um, someone had cut strips of different plastic types, um, conventional versus biopolymers, put them under the ocean, left them there for you know a, several months, and then grabbed them back out, and they were comparing how much they had broken down, and it was slightly more for the the bioplastics, but not appreciably more. And so, the the recommendation really is just to use less plastic there's not this magical plastic that's going to be you know appreciably less you know persistent at, at least at this point yeah yep all right final question of the evening thank you everyone for your, all of your questions this has been fantastic um derek asks what do you think is the future of plastic recycling disposal and incineration I think that recycling is going to be a difficult problem to tackle unless we better economically incentivize it. But there are so many plastic types right now that just aren't profitable to recycle. And that's really the main issue. And so if we can find a different way to recycle them that, that is profitable, that might be a possibility. But mostly what I hear and what has been aimed for in California is source reduction and thinking about a circular economy where producers are responsible for taking back their waste or for dealing with the waste they're producing. Um, a good example of this sort of starting to happen, there's a, there's a company called Loop, which is 
present in a lot of the larger cities in the US and I think in Europe as well. I wanna say they're in Paris and London, but they will sell products like ice cream or deodorant or toothpaste in containers that can be reused. And so you get the product in the mail, you use it up, you send it back to them and they refill it and they send it to somebody else. So I think that's the direction we're gonna to need to move in rather than, you know, incineration is not good because think of all the chemicals that are in plastics and that's just, you're releasing them into the environment. It's also increasing our, our carbon footprint. So, so yeah, source reduction is the way the way forward, I think. Excellent. Well, thank you again, Suzanne, for that incredible presentation and answering all of those questions. And thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. After the event ends, a survey about tonight's program will appear and we'd appreciate it if you could fill it out. And it will only take a couple of minutes. <laughs> um, and if you'd like to support the work of Deschutes Land Trust, please make a gift at DeschutesLandTrust.org backslash support. Thank you, everyone, and good night. Thank you.